Welcome to this fifth edition of the Eastern Pennsylvania ARRL TV show, What Hams Do. I'm your host, Jay Silver, WA2UAR, and tonight we'll take a look at amateur radio in space, the past, the present, and the future. Here's the lineup for tonight's show. First, we'll take a look at the news impacting amateur radio here in the Eastern Pennsylvania section of the ARRL and around the world. Then we'll start our exploration of outer space from the amateur radio point of view. It's a fascinating story. We'll interview some people who brought amateur radio and astronauts together in the classroom and on satellites all over the world. And we'll talk to one ham radio operator whose memories of one of the earliest Earth Space School presentations helped shape his lifetime of amateur radio communications. Now, this is Oscar One, the first amateur radio satellite in space. It was launched 60 years ago and transmitted a Morse code beacon that said hi to the whole world. It was only four years after the Russians launched the first man-made satellite, Sputnik and amateur radio began a long and fascinating journey into outer space. We'll take an in-depth look at where we've been, where we are, and where we're going, right after the news coming up in 30 seconds. Where can the skills you learn with ham radio take you? Amateur radio, often called ham radio, is the place where today's engineers got their start. Ham radio is more popular than ever before. With hands-on training in electronics, engineering, and digital communications, modern hams interface computers and radios in entirely new ways. Ham radio in the 21st century can take you around the world or into a whole new career. Learn more. Go to ARRL.org. Join us. ARRL in Pennsylvania worked with Representative Rosemary Brown and her staff to get exactly the language we've been seeking into House Bill 37, the distracted driving legislation. When introduced to the full House for a vote later this spring or summer, it will have an exemption allowing licensed amateur radio operators to use mobile and handheld radios while in their moving vehicles. We'll keep on top of the votes in the House and follow the bill as it moves next to the Pennsylvania Senate Transportation Committee. Joining us once again is our co-anchor, Frankie Botti, KE8HPA, just home from her first year at Case Western Reserve University. Frankie, what news do you have for us tonight? The exciting news is that Field Day is back on throughout America. In case you haven't heard of it, Field Day is Amateur Radio's biggest weekend of the year, where hams from all over the U.S. and Canada gather at outdoor locations. They'll be at parks and rec centers and other public gatherings to play radio. Amateur radio clubs will set up multiple radios and antennas in these outdoor spots and make contacts everywhere on planet Earth and beyond if you count the space station, racking up points for their clubs. Some COVID-19 restrictions may still apply in some states, and hams with health concerns are allowed to participate from home, as many did during the pandemic last year. Another sign restrictions are easing is the number of ham fests scheduled for the spring and summer. A ham fest is where amateur radio operators gather to trade and sell equipment and parts to each other, and listen to lectures on technical and practical subjects important to the amateur radio community. It's a great way to spend a very fun day with friends and ham radio colleagues. There's a pretty complete list of scheduled events on the ARRL website. We'll put the link to that page in the description below this video. The Harrisburg Firecracker Ham Fest is a statewide affair and it will be attended by ARRL leadership from both the Eastern and Western Pennsylvania sections. Back to you, Jay. Thanks, Frankie. Hey, will you be participating in Field Day? Yes, I will be, although I haven't finalized the plans with my younger brother and father, but we are all very excited to participate. Now, you just finished your freshman year at Case Western Reserve. What does it feel like to have done that? I am so incredibly excited, and I cannot wait um, to move back in in the fall and continue set my studies. Thanks, Frankie, and we'll see you in our next show. Now, also in Pennsylvania, we have new appointments. Lloyd Roach, a well-known broadcasting executive, is now the ARRL's government liaison. 
His years in the broadcasting business have brought him in contact with many state legislators and government officials. He'll be working to promote amateur radio interests in Harrisburg. And there's one other appointment we should mention. Drew McLucky of Wayne, Pennsylvania, has been named as the Eastern PA ARRL Youth Coordinator. So Drew, congratulations on your appointment. Tell us about yourself and your background with youth. Thanks, Jay. My name is Drew McLucky. Uh, my call is W3ZW, and I've been active working with youth over the last 30 years or so uh, in the scouting program. Um, but I have worked with youth uh, not only in our local scout council, but also in uh, some other scout camps in trying to help develop the amateur radio program there over the last 15 years or so. So what are your goals as the youth coordinator for Eastern Pennsylvania? We have a, a tremendous amount of resources here in Eastern Pennsylvania. We have lots of youth and we have lots of hams and trying to put them together has been the biggest challenge. Um, hams are very proud of their hobby and with the emphasis on STEM that you were seeing in schools and in, in youth groups, um, trying to get the two groups together is uh, really my goal. Any specific plans in the near future? We're beginning to uh, publicize and support uh, Youth Day, which is coming up in June, as well as youth involvement in Field Day, which is a couple days after, uh, a week after that. Um, and eventually, uh, for the Scouts, trying to line something up for Jamboree on the Air in October. Drew, that's fantastic. We wish you every success. I'll put your contact information in the description under this video on our YouTube channel. Take care. On Monday, May 3rd, several high-altitude balloons lifted off from the campus of Villanova University outside Philadelphia, headed for the edge of space. Each carried a tiny amateur radio transmitter, showing us exactly where it was in real time and how high it was flying. Villanova University's amateur radio faculty advisor and associate professor Alan Johnston, amateur call sign KU2Y, says students wanted to launch a weather balloon for over a year he credits their determination in the midst of the pandemic. The fact that they managed to do it this year, this school year, despite all the difficulties, I think really, really reflects on how, how determined they were. Uh, but the idea was to, uh, to, to send up a, uh, a high altitude weather balloon, basically up to the stratosphere, right up to the edge of space uh, with, a, with a little transmitting payload so we could track it and, uh, and get some data. And, uh, and perhaps even recover it uh, when it comes back down again. And uh, we, had a, we had a successful flight, um, and we, we even recovered it uh, in, uh, in New Jersey. So I followed the one balloon that went almost to the New Jersey coast and went up to 113,000 feet or something like that? Yeah, 105,000 feet, I think, was the maximum, yeah. And, uh, and why did it come down? What happens at that altitude? Yeah, yeah. So, so we, we deliberately overfill the balloons. They're just they're just latex balloons, and uh, and when we when we fill them on the ground, they're about I don't know they're about ten to twelve feet in diameter. Uh, when they reach that high an altitude, uh, they're they're basically twice the size, uh, and at that point the the latex bursts. So, uh, you know, you, you can have more complicated ways of getting your balloon down. But the simplest way is just you just overfill it so that it bursts and then it comes down under, its, uh, under a parachute. The transmitters on these balloons send data via the Automatic Packet Reporting System, or APRS, which is captured by a number of websites to show the real-time tracking information. I asked Alan why an amateur radio license was required for this project. Uh, well, it's the ability to, to transmit, right, in, in order to, anybody can receive you know, radio signals. But in order to transmit, uh, you need to be licensed by the FCC. Um, you need to have some some technical understanding of, of what's involved, the rules and regulations. Uh, and as as amateur radio operators, um, you know, we're very conscious to not interfere with anybody, whether it's whether it's other amateur radio operators or whether it's commercial or or other other users um, of of the spectrum. And we only use the minimum amount of power that we need uh, in order to do it. So, you know, these uh, I think the I think the one APRS tracker was was using one watt of power. <laughs> So you, know, you, you, you compare that to commercial broadcasts where they use kilowatts of power. <laughs> I, I'm looking at my amateur radio transmitters here. One of them weighs 10 pounds. One of them weighs about a pound, my little HT here. 
Uh, but all of that would seem too heavy for a, a balloon. How do you do? How do you do that? Yeah, it's it's specialized, um, very very uh, lightweight uh, payloads. Um, yeah, and uh, the we we flew a couple of we, we flew one commercial uh, payload, uh, and then the other two were were experimental ones. Um, one of the payloads we flew is actually it's actually a satellite. I actually have have one here. Uh, it's it's known as an Ambisat. It's a it's a it's a Sprite satellite, so it's designed to be to be deployed from space from a bigger satellite. And that's what we'll be talking to Alan about in the next segment of our program. Now, you'll notice the AMSAT logo on his shirt. AMSAT is the Amateur Radio Satellite Organization, and Alan is one of its executives. More on that coming up. And that's it from the What Hams Do Newsroom. We'll get back to the studio and our review of Amateur Radio in Space right after this message from the ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio. He speaks fluently in analog and digital, talks with people from seven continents in one weekend, chats with friends in 300 countries, and gets postcards from the most remote places on Earth. You run into a ham down he can contact satellites using a coat hanger, send email without the Internet, and no cell phones are not reliable. We're sorry. All lines are busy. He's a radio ham. Learn how at HelloRadio.org. ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio. Right now, aboard the International Space Station, an astronaut who is also a licensed amateur radio operator is within a few feet of the ISS ham radio station. That's right, there's a permanent amateur radio transmitter and receiver on board the International Space Station that astronauts use to speak to other ham radio operators around the world and to students all over the world who want to know more about living and working in space. The very first astronaut to operate a ham radio station in space was the late Dr. Owen K. Garriott, originally from Enid, Oklahoma. Dr. Garriott passed away at the age of 88 back in 2019, but his second mission to space, aboard the shuttle Columbia in 1983, was historic for the amateur radio community. From Columbia, using his radio call sign W5LFL, Dr. Gary had contacted 250 amateur radio operators around the world, including the late King Hussein of Jordan and the one-time presidential candidate Barry Goldwater of Arizona, both ham radio operators themselves. Since then, NASA began a program called SAREX, which allowed astronauts on space shuttle missions and on the Russian Mir space station to communicate with students around the world. And that transformed into today's amateur radio operations aboard the International Space Station, a program known by its acronym, ARIS. Here's a portion of a classroom event. If someone wants to be an astronaut when they grow up, what should they be doing now as a kid to prepare? Over. You know, that is a great question. Uh, there are three things you could do. One is study and work really hard in school. The second is set big goals for yourself because they'll motivate you and excite you. And the third thing is always play nice with others. <laughs> John Clute is the Director of Operations for ARIS USA and the Chair of the Operations Committee for ARIS International. He joins us now to talk about where ham radio has been in space and where it's going. Um, ARIS came into being with the, uh, as the International Space Station was constructed. And in fact, the ARIS program is the longest running experiment on the International Space Station. We have been continuously in operation for uh, 20 years now on the International Space Station. Before we get into the educational aspects of ARIS, let's tell our audience a little bit about amateur radio on the space station. Is there equipment? Are there people who use it? And what kind of amateur radio things are on the space station? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, presently, there are two uh, two-meter radios. Uh, two-meter um, is a frequency band that's kind of abo just above the FM broadcast band on your radio. And there are two FM radio, uh, two-meter FM radios on the International Space Station. One is located in the Columbus module. Uh, that is the relatively, that is a new system that we just flew. And then there is another uh, radio located in the service module, 
Uh, the the uh, we speak of the ISS as having two segments: the uh, U.S. operated segment and the Russian operated segment. One radio is in the U.S. segment; the other is in the um, um, Russian segment. Those radios are capable of operations on other bands, frequency bands higher than two meters, but right now we use them primarily on the two meter band. There's also a device on the space station that lets me send my voice on one frequency to the space station and it retransmits it to the ground on a different frequency. Yeah, that is correct. This is part of the new equipment that we flew that is presently in the uh, Columbus module. It's called a cross-band repeater, and it does exactly what you said. It allows you to talk up to the ISS on one frequency, and that, uh, that signal is then uh, repeated uh, and comes down on a different frequency. Somewhere else on the Earth. <laughs> Somewhere else, uh, yeah. Basically anywhere within the footprint. Uh, the footprint is is a word that you'll hear uh, space-oriented amateurs use, and it basically means the portion of the Earth that can be seen from uh, the ISS or any satellite, for that matter. It's like a giant circle. Because of those frequencies that it transmits on are known as line of sight. That is correct. Um, you have to be able to, both stations need to be able to see the International Space Station to be able to communicate through the International Space Station. Now, you get astronauts to talk live over amateur radio equipment to students around the world. How does that work? There are basically f uh, five Eris regions. They each have a little different process, but basically what happens is um, the school uh, makes an application, they're selected, then they are then they are scheduled, and at an appointed time, uh, the students have the opportunity to spend about ten minutes talking uh, to the astronaut. The I ISS is about two oh, a little over two hundred miles up in space, traveling at seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour. And remember, we said it was line line of sight. Uh, that means it takes about ten minutes for the ISS to travel from one horizon to the other. So that's the period of time where students have the ability to, uh, to talk to the ISS. So a licensed amateur radio operator somewhere is aiming an antenna at the space station. And how does that audio get to the school? There are basically three ways we do this. The first way is called a direct contact. That's where a local amateur radio team will actually take a radio station to the school and they will then um, hook it into the PA system and so then it's really a real-time on-site connection. The second way that we do this is something called the Telebridge state, uh, contact. We have 12 amateur radio certified by Aero stations around the world and basically that station will use two meters to establish the contact with the ISS and then over either the internet or a telephone, they are hooked back into the school. COVID has forced us to respond just like everyone else with a third option that we call a multi-point telebridge. With everyone not being able to be in school, using, again, either a telephone or a, a internet bridge such as Zoom or Google Meets, the students are actually in their homes talking to the ground station, who is talking to the ISS, and that's the third way that the contact can be established. What questions do these students typically ask the astronauts? Oh my gosh, there's, there's any range of questions. Uh, there's kind of the usual, you know, oh, uh, what do you eat? Um, is, is it scary when, the, when, when you launch? Um, how does it feel to be weightless? And then there are sometimes some really interesting questions like, um, what happens to your tears when you cry in space? Um, um, uh, what kind of games do you like to play? Uh, obviously, uh, a board game is rather difficult <laughs> because the pieces would just all float off. Uh, so it's just a, it's a, it's a never ending range of questions. I'm always amazed at the creativity of the students. That's really that's really interesting. So, you've you've probably been in touch with a lot of these schools and students and the astronauts. 
What does it mean to each of them? What does it mean to the kids in the schools? And what does it mean to the astronauts? Well, to the kids, to the kids, it's really an opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, and some of them are very hesitant at the start, but when it's over, they all are just ecstatic that they, they, they've talked with an astronaut. It really is a, a, a very powerful experiment for them. On the occasion of the 1,000th amateur radio contact made from the space station to amateur radio operators on planet Earth, the organizations involved in ham radio in space published this video. So the Earth program is a way for people on the ground to get in touch with the astronauts on orbit in the space station through a ham radio. You have a chance to talk to people all over the planet using ARIS, you know, the amateur radio board, the International Space Station. You, uh, I mean, you can look down and say, oh, there's Australia, and you pick up, you know, and you see QCQ, and there's somebody out there, and, and uh, they answer, and you, and you meet a new friend. The ARIS program is important because it, I think, teaches, especially kids, a technology in communication. It also teaches them about timing. It teaches them about uh, the um, position of an object in space with respect to where they are on the Earth. I think it's a great educational tool as well as a way to communicate uh, with people in space. Science, technology, engineering, and math, that's what really makes a space station fly. So if you can imagine a kid who gets a chance to talk to somebody aboard that space station as it whips on by at 17,000 miles an hour, then you know I, I think it's gonna capture their interest. I think a thousand contacts is an incredible milestone for NASA and namely the students who, uh, they're the ones that achieved this. They're the ones that made the contact with NASA. We just provided the platform for them to do it. And if you think about these kids being the ones that are the future of space exploration, the future of NASA and all of our space programs around the world, they are learning at such an early age um, how to overcome this barrier, this challenge we have of communicating with others in space. And what a great start. And to reach a thousand, uh, you know, I think it's just motivating. A thousand contacts. Who would have ever thought? That means a thousand times we've had a chance to, to reach down to planet Earth and make contact and to inspire the next generation of explorers. And so I congratulate the ARIS program. I congratulate amateur radio enthusiasts all over this beautiful planet for supporting these contacts, a thousand of them. Who would have ever guessed that we'd have so many? Congratulations. Ham radio is surprisingly impactful. And I say it's surprisingly because you sort of feel like it's only, a, you know, it's a small amount of training and all the training that you do. Um, and you're told a little bit about it, and it's like I got a whole bunch of things to do. I might do a spacewalk. I might do, you know, grab a visiting vehicle for the first time. Like, do I really have time for this? And it's five minutes on your schedule. And we would just zip down, fly down to the Russian segment, turn the radio on, and then start talking to a group of people. And it sounds like only 10 kids, and it's sometimes the radio clarity is not great just because of the fact that you are working on ham radio. Sometimes it's super clear if you're right over them. Um, and so you have the questions a little bit beforehand just to so help you a little bit through it. Um, and so you go through it, and then you get a report about how many people were at that event and how long and how much preparation those kids took to actually understand ham radio and work with it. And I felt myself getting choked up every time I would read one of those reports. And, and, and I was like, oh my god, this is great. I didn't realize that like maybe a thousand kids are at an event. The impact of a contact with an astronaut in space lasts for years, as we'll hear now from Stephen Hawk, amateur radio call sign WU3I, a ham radio operator here in the Philadelphia area. Well, Jay, uh, actually, it was 28 years ago this month, April of 1993, and it had to do with STS-56 Space Shuttle Discovery at the Franklin Institute at our station near, which at that time was W3TKQ, subsequently became W3AA, uh, we had a space shuttle contact. And we had, uh, we had students from the West Town School in Chester County. And uh, 
we stayed overnight at the museum because the contact was at seven o'clock in the morning. And we uh, we spent uh, months preparing for this. Just recently, since you brought this subject up and I started reflecting, I realized how long it's been. And most of these kids are now parents themselves of kids the same age they were when they talked to the astronauts. So it was it was kind of neat. We had a single pass. Uh, we had eight or ten kids. Only one got to ask their question of the astronaut uh, because the pass was very quick. And uh, unfortunately, just that's just the way it is when you're traveling at 17,000 miles an hour and you've got an acquired signal that goes with the horizon. But um, subsequent to that mission, the, uh, the school was a Quaker school in West Town in Chester County here in Pennsylvania. And the mission commander, Ken Cameron, was sent by NASA to the school after testifying in D.C. And every kid who was there got to ask their question and every child in the school got to meet the astronaut through the Quaker meeting house at the school. Subsequent to the space station, space shuttle contact uh, back in 93, I built up a satellite operations station. Now to operate satellites properly, you need azimuth elevation rotators to follow the satellites as they track across the sky because this is all line of sight communication it's in the vhf and uhf spectrums and uh, i built that up after over some time because it, it's it wasn't inexpensive but uh, it was fun i had a lot of fun with it and i made a lot of satellite contacts and that was just one of the many fleeting modes i operated over my four decades as a ham radio operator you don't need much in the way of equipment to reach the space station or an amateur radio satellite. A little handheld low power amateur radio like this one and a handheld antenna pointed at where satellite tracking websites show you the space station or satellite is when it passes over near you is all you need. Or as Steve mentioned, you can use automated tracking antennas with motors that aim them where the websites say the satellites are going to be. Now this is Sputnik. It was the first man-made satellite ever to orbit the Earth. It was launched by the Soviet Union in 1957, starting the space race between the U.S. and the Soviets. But just four years later in 1961, the first amateur radio satellite called Oscar-1 went into space, beeping its Morse code message high over and over again to the entire world. Oscar-1 was built by the Redondo Beach, California-based TRW Amateur Radio Club. Its members were engineers with the TRW Aerospace Company. Yeah, I mean, it, it's quite remarkable that the first amateur radio satellite was launched just a few years after the very first satellite. Uh, and a few years after that, uh, AMSAT, the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, was formed with the goal of trying to get uh, amateur radio satellites uh, up there. And uh, they they managed to launch, you know, every every few years they they put up another uh, another Oscar uh, satellite, uh, and they basically pioneered this whole uh, notion of of sort of ride sharing, that you've got you've got a big rocket with a big satellite going into orbit, and then you just piggyback a smaller satellite onto it. Uh, we we did the first of that, and of course that's that's very common today. Uh, most small satellites that get that get launched. Are a secondary payload from a much larger, uh, much more expensive satellite that's that's getting launched, um, and in particular, AMSAT. We actually sort of, we were sort of the the forerunners for the CubeSat movement today, um, which which has really really opened up space to all kinds of uh, uh, educational users. And of course, AMSAT today we launch uh, CubeSats as well. NASA took the CubeSat idea and now has a set of design specs that researchers in any field can follow to create cubes containing various electronics and experiments that are 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters and weigh less than three pounds. Each cube is referred to as a U or unit in its dimensions, as Alan explains. Yeah, so uh, amateur radio satellites these days have um, typically have transponders on board uh, so that amateurs can actually uh, use them to to talk to talk to other hams. 
Uh, so they they have a receiver that listens on one frequency and they have a transmitter that transmits on a different frequency and whatever signals they receive, they basically relay it back down to earth. So they act like much more expensive communication satellites that we use for, for relaying voice and video and, and things all around the world. Um, but, but, but we do this on very, 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 very small and inexpensive um, satellites. And as they fly over, uh, hands get on their radios and they and they try to talk to each other um, during these passes. It's it's a lot of fun. So I have so this is a this is a engineering model of the AMSAT CubeSat Fox One. In the past, the most expensive thing about a, a satellite is is the launch, is getting it getting it into orbit, and uh, and when you finished your satellite, you basically give it to the give it to the rocket company and say, here, launch this for me. And they figure out how to mount it and how to how to eject it and all that kind of thing. Well, CubeSats was the first attempt to try to standardize this. So if, if every satellite is this shape and size, then you can basically stack them all up and you can launch a whole bunch of them at the same time. And that that really reduced the, the uh, launching costs of, uh, of CubeSats and and today with all the competition in space, all these startup companies um, that are that are you know launching small rockets, um, we're, we're really seeing the cost to get to orbit uh, much much less, and uh, and so CubeSats have been super popular for educational missions, high schools, universities, graduate students um, build them, and they also typically fly experiments too. So they do something in space, something about you know radiation, or they have sensors, or they have cameras. Um, some of the ones that AMSAT launched have a little a little low resolution camera. You see down the bottom there that that snaps pictures of the Earth as it flies by. Now we're looking at all kinds of interesting things happening in space. The Chinese just landed a rover on Mars. We've had a rover there since February. We've been on Mars for a while. We're going back to the Moon in a few years. Where is AMSAT going? Yeah, so so AMSAT has launched quite a number of uh, of, of CubeSats, um, but now we're we're launching, uh, and, and those are all called the the Fox series. So there was Fox One A, Fox One B, Fox One C, and the like. Um, but now we're getting ready for our next series of satellites, which are the Golf series, right? Going the phonetic alphabet uh, from from F to G. Um, and these are these are also CubeSats, but they're actually you can in addition to these square CubeSats, you can build them in multiples. So a two U is basically twice as long, and a three U, which is what uh, AmpSat is building for their Golf, is basically three times as long. So it's thirty centimeters by ten centimeters by ten centimeters. So we have a few of those that we're building, and um, the first of them it's called Golf T. Um, it actually just uh, it just got manifest on uh, on NASA's uh, Alana program, which is their program where they give free launches for for educational uh, CubeSats. So we just got manifest on uh, on Alana 46. So hopefully in the coming months we'll be finding out what what time frame uh, we will be going to space with that. And then after that we have a series of additional. Uh, I think the one after that is going to be Golf One. And then who knows uh, what we do in the future? But but we will we will hopefully have these bigger, um, more more powerful, more functionality uh, cubesats flying in the future. Have you thought about uh, things like putting a, a a cubesat around the in orbit around the moon, or perhaps in orbit around Mars? Yeah, there there uh, there are amateur radio groups looking at exactly that. Uh, it's extremely challenging, of course. Once you get once you get further further than low Earth orbit, um, it's it's you know you, you need much bigger antennas uh, and the like. There's also the um, you might be familiar with the NASA Gateway project, which is there. Um, it's it's basically a, a station that will that will orbit the Earth and the Moon, and um, and there's basically plans to to fly an amateur radio uh, experiment on that. Um, so that will have, in, that that will have uh, hopefully a uh, a repeater, and it will also have telemetry and uh, and and other things. Well, Alan, we will be watching, <laughs> and I want to thank you for your time. This was a great interview. Is there anything you anything else you'd like to tell me? Uh, no, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity, Jay. And uh, you know, amateur radio has been has been great for my career, and uh, I I really enjoy 
you know, working with students and uh, and using amateur radio and satellites and balloon flights to to get them excited about uh, about STEM and the like. Dr. Alan Johnston of AMSAT and Villanova University, practicing and teaching the many exciting aspects of amateur radio in space. Well, that's our show for tonight. Now, if you're interested in becoming an amateur radio operator so you can do some of these exciting things, talk to the space station, talk to hams around the world by bouncing signals off satellites, transmitting high altitude balloon data on amateur radio frequencies, then you should take a look at this webpage, What is Ham Radio? from the ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio. We'll put the link for that webpage in this video's description down below. Now, if you've enjoyed this show, please subscribe to our channel and don't forget to click the notification bell so you know when we upload our next show. For now, this is Jay Silber, the Public Information Coordinator for the ARRL's Eastern Pennsylvania section, saying 73. That's how hams say goodbye. And reminding you that this isn't your grandfather's amateur radio. Take care, everybody.